When NATO was created at the beginning of the Cold War, it was essential to have a group of legislators, legislators from Europe and North America being the core of NATO, who were able to explain to their electorates why they were committed to defence, why they were spending money on defence, and to justify to their electorates the policies that NATO was going to follow. And who better to do that than indeed members of parliament, who after all are responsible to their voters for the money that is committed to defence, and who are also responsible for the commitment of armed forces, the men and women of those armed forces, who possibly may give their lives uh, in that collective defence. So that was the origins of the North Atlantic Assembly, a group of legislators from North America and from Europe coming together on a regular basis in order to share thoughts, experiences, and to make more transparent uh, the policies of the NATO alliance and to make more transparent to their voters so that their voters would understand and hopefully support those policies. The North Atlantic Assembly was the initial name of this group. The name was changed uh, in the 1990s to align it much more closely with NATO itself. Well, I think our members uh, tried to rally support for NATO in their member countries, in their parliaments, which wasn't always easy because there were controversial issues like high defense budgets, and of course they were much higher than they have been in recent years. There were controversial issues like nuclear weapons. Uh, the famous double track decision is one example. And they took a stand on these issues and helped NATO gain and maintain popular and parliamentary support. And the assembly equipped them very well for that because it supplied them with complete and comprehensive information on the issues with all its briefings with the best experts from different governments, universities, think tanks, and also this opportunity to exchange views with your colleagues from other member countries. So I think we went well equipped into these debates we had to lead at home. Well, the the best example is, of course, the double track decision that was a acrimonious and bitter fight in many countries. And we were close to a diplomatic, major diplomatic defeat of the West. If in some countries uh, the opposition would have been so strong that governments would have go, had to go back on their commitment to deploy, which didn't happen and which I think therefore was an important step towards the end of the Cold War but it needed great effort, not just from governments, but from parliaments, and particularly ours as well. It was, of course, not easy for some East Europeans, when they started to have contacts with the West, to establish first contacts with NATO, because NATO had been the arch enemy, had been depicted as almost the empire of evil by Soviet propaganda for all those years. So it was easier to talk to us. We were close to NATO, but not part of it. And contacts with us were less formal and less official. And I think the first contact we established with Hungary was exactly the right one, because this was the country that was more prepared than others at the time to change and to open up to the West. And some of the people we talked to, like Julia Holm, who was then a deputy foreign minister, later made world history, just about a year later when he as foreign minister opened the border for the East German refugees to Austria so that they could get to West Germany and thus that was a huge step towards the opening of the wall and the end of the Cold War. Well, I, I, I just think parliaments are not bound by the rules of diplomacy. They can act more easily, less formally and maybe in difficult situations, some contacts on the parliamentary level can help to break the ice between different countries before official contacts on the governmental level are made. I think it has been a huge success story. 
The original aim, as defined by the first Secretary General Lord Ismay, to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down, has been achieved. The Russians came never in, the Americans stayed, and the Germans were integrated and became a full partner instead of a former enemy, as was the case at the beginning. So I think it's a happy story, and in view of recent events, it needs to be prolonged, because there are still new challenges that NATO needs to face, and therefore it needs to keep together. The fall of the Berlin Wall was immensely important, of course. But I see it as primarily symbolic. The North Atlantic Assembly had already perceived a glimmer of light in this long, dark uh, tunnel that existed between the West and the East uh, in uh, Europe and the confrontation uh, between NATO and uh, the Warsaw Pact nations. The glimmer of light was the announcement in 1984 of a meeting the following year between President Reagan and the new president of the Soviet Union, Mr. Gorbachev. And at the annual meeting of the assembly in San Francisco in 1984, I publicly asked Secretary of State George Shultz, and it's all recorded, in view of that meeting ahead, would he urge President Reagan to go one step further? And it was clear in his reply that Mr. Shultz was reluctant. Yet we all know that the meeting in Reykjavik between Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev was historic, illuminating, happily productive of, of a new feeling between East and West, especially when Mr. Gorbachev announced Perestroika and uh, a Glasnost. And I'm not aware of any other body that was quicker off the mark in taking advantage of, of this new glimmer of light, the new opportunities for uh, uh, renewed understanding with the East, even institutional building, than the North Atlantic Assembly. Because uh, one of its subcommittees paid an early visit and certain members of the Assembly, notably uh, Mr. Bruce George of the UK and uh, Mr. Loic Bouvard of France were tireless in 86, in 1987, in 1988 in visits, notably to Poland but also to Hungary, to Czechoslovakia and then to the other members of the Warsaw Pact nations in discussing uh, parliamentary procedures as they could be adopted by the members of the Warsaw Pact and I for my part especially when I became president of the North Atlantic Assembly associated myself with such initiatives in Eastern Europe by leading uh, delegations to Czechoslovakia, to Hungary, to East Germany and, uh, and then finally in July 1989 I led a comprehensive delegation from the West that included members of, representative members, that is to say, ministers, former ministers and parliamentarians from nearly all the member nations uh, of, uh, uh, of the West uh, uh, to Moscow. That was an enormously successful visit. It generated such goodwill on both sides as my delegation was received first of all by Mr. Primikov, who was the closest associate then of uh, Mr. Gorbachev, who was addressing a meeting of the Council of Europe at the time and couldn't be present. Mr. Primikov only passed away in uh, recent uh, weeks. Mr. Primikov was most accommodating in arranging our programme 
acceded to every request I made uh, of him for a visit here or, or there or a particular meeting. And uh, indeed, we had meetings with every department of state in Moscow. We met all the senior and junior ministers of Mr. Gorbachev. Two or three weeks later, I was chairing the first meeting in Bonn of parliamentarians from NATO and from the Warsaw Treaty Organization. And another two weeks into the beginning of November, I was chairing proceedings in London that lasted a week that was really an annual meeting of the North Atlantic Assembly, but we made it an occasion to mark the end of the Cold War. And we invited all the members of the Warsaw Pact uh, nations to uh, join us and for the duration of the week-long conference um, be regarded as associates. And that also had the happiest possible outcome. La chute de l'Empire soviétique la, et la chute du rideau de fer, donc à partir de 89, a été euh, à l'origine d'une transformation complète de l'Europe. Et pour nous qui étions à l'avant-garde, en quelque sorte, l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OTAN, nous, nous avons pu nous trouver à, aux avant-postes dans le contact avec les populations et les États de l'Est. En face de nous, nous avions depuis des années l'Union soviétique, monolithe, cet énorme empire qui menaçait l'Europe de l'Ouest, notre Europe. Et puis, euh, un beau jour, eh bien, tout cela s'est effondré. Qui l'eût cru que sans un coup de fusil, eh bien, l'Empire soviétique s'écroulerait Alors nous, pour notre part, Nous avions la possibilité, étant des députés, donc nous n'engagions pas les gouvernements, nous étions membres des, du corps législatif de nos démocraties, nous avions la possibilité de rencontrer nos alter ego à l'Est. Ça, 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 ça se faisait d'une façon à pas feutrer avant la chute du rideau de fer, évidemment, mais il y avait déjà des contacts. Je me souviens très bien des contacts que nous avions avec l'ambassadeur de Hongrie à Bruxelles, un peu avant la chute du mur. Et ensuite, nous avons pu nous précipiter en quelque sorte, d'ailleurs, nous étions welcome par tous ces gens-là, nous représentants de l'Alliance Atlantique qui avait vaincu l'Empire soviétique. On était reçus dans tous les peuples, dans tous ces pays de l'Europe de l'Est, qui depuis 40 ans vivaient sous le joug communiste de l'URSS, nous étions reçus comme des libérateurs. Nous n'étions pas, nous n'engageons pas nos, nos gouvernements. Nous n'étions pas membres des gouvernements. Nous étions membres des parlements. Et à ce titre, nous avions une liberté de parole et de contact que n'auraient peut-être pas eu les représentants de nos gouvernements, nos ministres. Et nous avons profité de cela pour établir des contacts partout en Europe. Je dois vous dire que je garde de cette période un souvenir ému et fantastique. Nous allions de pays en pays en 1989, 90, 91, 92, et nous les voyions d'une part, je, parle, je vous parlerai de la Russie ensuite, mais tous les pays satellites accédaient à la dépendance, commençaient à respirer. Et c'était une méconnaissance totale entre l'Est et l'Ouest. C'est là que l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OTAN a joué un grand rôle, car nous représentions l'Ouest d'une façon très humaine, très ouverte, de parlementaire à parlementaire. Il y avait un certain dialogue qui pouvait s'instaurer très facilement. C'est vrai que l'alliance de ce fait s'est transformée, car très vite, nous avons, et ça j'en viens alors à ce que j'ai beaucoup vécu, étant président de 92 à 94, nous avons permis aux représentants de ces nations de devenir membres associés de l'Assemblée parlementaire de l'OTAN. Alors je dois maintenant vous dire un mot de l'Union soviétique qui s'est délabrée 
nous avons été reçus par eux, alors que c'était encore l'URSS, nous avons été reçus et ils étaient sidérés de nous voir, nous, des parlementaires. Je me souviens de, avec mon ami Bruce George et une délégation, nous avons été reçus par tous les maréchaux soviétiques, encore, et il y avait une sorte d'appréhension. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui se passe euh, Comment se fait-il que nous ayons maintenant à, à nous parler Et là, l'Assemblée a beaucoup fait pour que les généraux américains et les généraux russes se rencontrent. On a établi le dialogue avec les Russes, avant même que l'Union soviétique tombe et devienne la Russie avec les, les autres composants de ce qu'était l'Union soviétique. Avec la Russie, nous avons tout de suite été vers eux pour établir aussi un dialogue avec les Russes. Et personnellement, j'ai beaucoup œuvré dans ce sens-là. J'ai toujours estimé que pour l'avenir, et vous voyez, je crois que ce qui se passe aujourd'hui montre bien que ceux qui pensaient comme moi avaient raison. Nous ne pouvions pas construire un avenir de paix et de sécurité en Europe sans la Russie. In the first phase of the conflict of Yugoslavia, it was about preventing violence. But once the military conflict had escalated between uh, the rest of Yugoslavia and Slovenia, and uh, then later on with Croatia, it was clear that politically clear at least that you could not keep Yugoslavia together as it had been in the past, as it existed in the past. Therefore, it was in the assembly and in many other different forces the question of how you could prevent the military conflict to escalate further. But then, after the conflicts in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, it became clear that even that was no longer possible. And then the debate was whether to engage in the conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And uh, I think that uh, many in the assembly discovered and uh, that if we would have acted earlier, we could have prevented uh, uh, a lot of the military escalation later on. But we especially in Srebrenica, NATO uh, reacted too late, in my view. And this was debated in the Assembly. Then, uh, before the uh, conflict escalated further into Kosovo, I uh, was going with, uh, as president, uh, with uh, a small delegation to Belgrade. And uh, I discussed with uh, the leadership at that time in Belgrade, the political leadership, and with the opposition that uh, it was an illusion that they could count upon that uh, uh, the European Union and NATO would split among traditional lines between Germany, France, Britain and the United States, that we would stand together and that there was no chance for them to split this united NATO and this united Europe. And uh, I offered them even at that time to get an associated membership status with NATO's parliamentary assembly if they would uh, try to prevent violence and escalation and go in the direction of the West. They did the other, they went the other way. We were not successful. And therefore, uh, with the majority of NATO countries, we had uh, to act militarily in the war in Kosovo. This was the next step in which my country for the first time intervened in such a way after World War II in a military conflict. After that war, Uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of NATO sent a delegation, and I was chairing that delegation, to Macedonia, where we again tried to prevent the next step of escalation uh, in, uh, of a conflict, possible conflict between Macedonia and, uh, and uh, Serbia proper. There we were successful, and there we visited uh, uh, UN troops, blue helmets, who were there stationed there to prevent an escalation of the conflict. And the interesting point of that was that the, uh, uh, in this uh, UN presence of Blue Helmets were American soldiers who stood under the command not of American officers but of UN officers. And this was also a very interesting step in the development of Western institutions. The discussion in NATO Parliament about NATO enlargement started much, much earlier than in uh, NATO itself. Actually, when I, together with some American Congress members, started a working group on uh, NATO enlargement, and I became the general rapporteur of this working group, uh, somebody asked at that time inside NATO, who has uh, Carsten Folk giving the right, been given the right to establish such a group? And Simon Land, who was at that time general secretary 
of the NATO's parliamentary assembly answered, that's how he told me, that you misinterpret Carsten Folk if you would think that he is asking somebody in advance. Anyhow, we started this uh, group on NATO enlargement, and at that time the majority of the members inside the NATO's parliamentary assembly were still opposed to a NATO enlargement. And the majority of NATO countries were opposed, and the majority in the German government were opposed, and the majority at that time of the US Congress and of the US administration were opposed. So we started as a minority, but this minority composed a couple of members from the US Congress, some Democrats, some Republicans. It was assisted scientifically by some researchers, for example, especially from the RAND Corporation in Santa Monica, and it was supported uh, directly by a minority in the German Social Democratic Party and a minority in the Christian Democratic Party represented by, at that time, Defense Minister Volker Rühe. And step by step, we convinced more and more people inside the assembly uh, that one should support NATO enlargement. And then we sent out letters to all uh, potential uh, NATO members in the East. But we also sent those letters to Russia and said, are you in favor, are you against? Uh, is it really necessary to deploy nuclear weapons in those cases? Should one not combine the process of NATO enlargement with a closer cooperation with Russia? Should one not combine it with the process of the arts disarmament? These were all questions which we asked in a long, long letter. Uh, and all the delegations sent the answers back a long time before those questions were asked by NATO itself. So I think this was a typical example where uh, uh, inside the NATO parliament a discussion led to a change of opinions and where step by step it assisted in the process in which NATO itself uh, uh, changed its view and became supportive of a process of NATO enlargement. That was, uh, that was the first time NATO was going to act militarily out of area of the, of the territory of NATO as defined in the original treaty. And uh, the reason why uh, NATO wanted to, and the European allies in NATO wanted to act, is that uh, the humanitarian situation in Kosovo and Bosnia was absolutely terrible. Uh, Milosevic was practically trying to annihilate all the population there. And uh, the instability in the area was affecting practically the whole of Europe. So the European allies decided it was the time to, the right time to, to use uh, NATO militarily. Um, it was a rather difficult decision to take. It was acting out of area. Uh, the Americans were rather doubtful. But in the end, they decided to help the European allies and that's how the whole thing came about and uh, NATO, as, as I said before, for the first time, decided to act militarily out of area. That was a, a first in the alliance history. The NATO countries uh, were in a rather difficult uh, position and the NATO parliaments as well because the public opinion was divided, was uh, very deeply divided about uh, what to do, how to do it and whether to intervene or not to intervene. Again, it was the first time that was going to be done. It was going to be done without a, a proper endorsement of the Security Council on the part of the US Security Council, mainly because the Russians were against, uh, so there was a Russian veto. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it was the, uh, what, what the international community had started to define as to the need to intervene, the need to intervene when whenever there was going to be a catastrophe in humanitarian terms somewhere in the world. So um, for the NATO Parliamentary uh, Assembly, it was a rather difficult decision. I, I was the president at the time. I had to put together all the things I could do because I felt that uh, it was the right time for the Assembly to, to come in, in, in support and in favor of the decisions taken by the government. Uh, I knew very well that there were a number of uh, doubts, dithering, and that uh, it could be argued both ways. But I felt at the same time that uh, it, uh, if there is one time, if there was one time when uh, NATO as such, the government needed support from the Parliamentary Assembly was that time. So I uh, worked together with a number of allies. Uh, it did help the fact that uh, Javier Solana, a good friend of mine, was uh, the Secretary General of the Assembly at that, at that time. Uh, certainly he did play his role as well. 
And um, well, we, we, we came very much in favor of, of the intervention. I wouldn't say uh, the majority was, was very large, but it was a sufficient minority, majority to, to, to show support for the decisions of the Alliance. Um, I, I think it, uh, that was a very wise decision to take in spite of all the doubts because that opened the way to uh, a number of uh, future interventions by NATO outside the area of NATO, be it in Afghanistan, be it in, in several other places in the world. And uh, at the end of the day, NATO played a very substantial role in stabilizing the area. And I think that, uh, that from that viewpoint, we should be glad we took the decision we took, uh, helping and, uh, and supporting the the governments in NATO to intervene in Kosovo at the time? Well, in general, what we learned is that uh, NATO was called to, to play a rather significant role, not only in the North Atlantic area, which was the one defined in the Washington Treaty, but in general around the world as a stabilizing factor. Uh, after all, uh, there was a very powerful military machine, it was a very powerful political machine, we were going through a number of difficulties around the world because of, uh, well, the disappearance of Yugoslavia on one side because of a number of instabilities in some other areas. And uh, what we learned in the Parliamentary Assembly, it was the time at the same time when the Parliamentary Assembly was about to open the, the membership to new members. Uh, let's uh, remember as well that uh, uh, the Soviet Union was about to disappear, that had practically disappeared, the number of new members were coming, former members of the, of the Warsaw Pact were becoming members of the, of the Warsaw Pact, of the, of the NATO uh, Parliamentary Assembly, of NATO as such. So what we learned is that uh, the, the world was far larger than we had originally uh, imagined through the Washington Treaty, that we were no longer uh, six or 14 or 15, but we were practically more than 20, now 28 member countries with a different uh, approach to, uh, to international relations. And uh, we learned how to look at large at the world. And uh, the world was uh, in some, somehow, some, some, uh, in many different ways, in need of NATO. So that's what we, uh, what we learned, that NATO was uh, conceived for a rather limited area in, in Europe what was needed in far larger areas. And uh, that was the main lesson. That was the big lesson. That was a very uh, positive lesson we learned in those years. On September 11, almost 3,000 people were killed in the towers and in the Pentagon. Only one month afterwards, the assembly was gathering in Ottawa, in Canada. I was the president at the time. It was a very emotional uh, meeting where there were lots of solidarity towards our American colleagues. There was a strong declaration. But uh, what I want to keep from that moment is that for us, it, it was beyond the solidarity with the people of America, but uh, we felt somehow threaten and attack in our beliefs, in our uh, feelings, in our principles and goals of we parliamentarians of the NATO Assembly. That was the, the, the core issue and the core reaction. And there was a declaration with a very strong uh, reference to how did we support the right of our American uh, friends and colleagues to react by using all the means that they reach uh, using the UN Security Council resolution, using NATO declaration invoking for the first time Article 5, and how we wanted also to, them to, to understand that for us it wasn't only an attack uh, to, uh, in American soil, but it was a terrorist attack in the core of the uh, alliance. It, it, was, it didn't Pass uh, a lot of time afterwards, and then there were the terrorist attacks in, in London and in my own country in Spain, where more than a thousand people were killed. And we learned from that that we had to remain uh, united and that we had to take measures to reinforce our capabilities, our intelligence, 
and our solidarity. And that was a very important moment that uh, I keep well deep in, in my mind and in my heart. Terror is, is now a major threat, not only to the uh, Alliance countries, but to entire humanity. We see terrorist attack in Asia, we see it in Africa, we see it in, in, in our core in Europe and also in the, in the States. I remember it was in mid-90s when I promoted a, a study group to reach out our friends in the southern uh, side of the Mediterranean. And Moroccan, Algerians, Jordan, Israelis, members of parliament became associated uh, with a special status within the assembly. Afterwards, there came the, the Arab Spring, and we thought that that would be the, the evolution towards a, a normal a democratic states, where regardless of their religion. But what we see now is that more and more we are uh, suffering in our societies the attack of those extremist groups, be it Daesh or be it in, in, in Al Qaeda or other groups who are associated or not with, with those groups. And what we see now is that uh, the victims of those attacks are mostly Arab and Muslim people. We are all, our Christian civilization, our Western civilization, but also the Arab civilization under this threat, which is uh, dif difficult to counter, which is difficult to fight. And I think that NATO and the Alliance are doing uh, their job in trying to cooperate with those who are facing more directly, uh, like, like in the case of Iraq, or like in the, in the case of the uh, Organization of uh, African Union, uh, by training them, by helping them to be prepared, to be ready to counter with their military, with their intelligence uh, capabilities, R sharing intelligence, which is essential, and that's something that uh, we parliamentarians know well from our classified uh, briefings. Sharing intelligence uh, as a means to try and prevent, but being aware that uh, this crazy uh, way of acting, of terrorists, cannot be always countered. And we're watching every now and then those attacks in our soil, be it in France, be it in, in other countries, in, in, the, in the States. And we have to cooperate further the Europeans, the Americans, what the European Union is doing in the in Southern Mediterranean, and what uh, America is doing in, in Southern Mediterranean is a way to, to counter it. Also, in the case of uh, Syria, a counter in Syria with uh, reinforcing Iraqis, with the agreement with Iran might be a help. And this week, uh, the Spanish Parliament has passed uh, a law that will allow the big base of Moron to become a permanent base for the United States on their missions in Africa, be it training or be of other military nature. Well, indeed, after the attack on the United States World Trade Center in 9-11, uh, the NATO invoked Article 5, which is the collective defense mechanism, for the first time ever. And it was exceedingly important to the United States and to the American citizenry. It was, of course, the first time it was invoked, and Americans never expected it would be invoked for their benefit. But it was important, as I said. It gave us a feeling that we had solidarity. And immediately thereafter, actually, we had an annual meeting in Ottawa, where it became quite clear how magnificent that support for America was in the face of this tragedy. The Speaker Hastert came with me to that, to that meeting, and I succeeded uh, then President Estrella the next term. Um, so it can't be overestimated how important that really was as a step. The Assembly took immediate uh, steps to begin studies in its committees and to take action. Uh, shortly thereafter, of course, we had the effort to displace the Taliban from Afghanistan. And since that time, the Assembly has uh, conducted about, I think it's 27 reports, every year at least one or two, most cases two, sometimes three different studies focused on Afghanistan. 
So that was the follow-up, and we knew that we would have NATO support for our actions in Afghanistan, all of which tri was triggered, of course, by the terrorist attack in New York City. NATO's response and support for the United States in our initiative in Afghanistan was very strong, very important to us. It was really the first time we had a major out-of-area operation by NATO. It was complex. It was uh, extremely important. And as a result of that, uh, the Assembly, with its steady efforts, sent a number of delegations to Afghanistan for this entire period of time. That enabled them, I think, to understand what was happening there, to give us their support. And I think it can't be said too much that the support and knowledge about NATO with the members of the Assembly and their individual national parliaments really has been a, a strength of the NATO operation in total. Without that kind of sustained support and knowledge within the individual parliaments or in the Congress of the United States, you wouldn't have the kind of support that's necessary for NATO to continue its operations. So this was an important milestone for NATO's involvement. And of course, it led it to look more carefully at what its larger role might be outside of Europe. We, in turn, I think, at the Assembly in the past, and I'm sure today, also provide a valuable indication about what the support or concerns are in the citizenry of our individual countries, which is important to the military establishment uh, of NATO, and it is the basis of the continuing support for NATO. So I think also it's important for NATO Assembly to realize that the ongoing studies not only inform the membership, they are our opportunity to provide real input to the national leaders in our political and military dimensions. I'm in the Assembly since 1983. And 19 89, at the beginning of the, of the fall of the Iron Curtain, I, I, was, I was part of the, the huge delegation, important delegation that visit Moscow with a huge delegation with four American senators and a lot of members of parliament. And it was for us an excitement, a new thing, uh, of, the, of the new eve, of the new times. And um, since then, we, we, we that, through that visit, we could understand what should be done. And the assembly became, after that, uh, a kind of laboratory for the assembly, for, for the alliance. Uh, the alliance didn't react at that time. And the assembly started to, to, to create uh, some, some, some uh, uh, events, some organizations, in order to face the new times that we are facing with. At that time, we created, in 1990, the associate uh, member status that uh, was uh, uh, able to, to gather parliamentarians from East, uh, Eastern and Central Europe that were former members of the Varsal Pact. On the same time, we create the Rose Ross Seminar conferences that uh, were allowed to, 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 to debate the relations between civilians and militaries. And uh, uh, all the time, uh, later on, we, we, we create uh, the, 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 the Mediterranean Special Group, the Assembly is elaborate again, that uh, permits the, the, the relationship between, between the, 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 the countries from the Gulf and North Africa to, to, to the Allies. And that was very important in order to show up the ways we have, the way you have to do. And the Alliance was following us, uh, adopting our, our decisions, as, as I told you, as a laboratory, from a political laboratory for the Alliance to, 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 to this. And later on, we created the, the NATO-Russia uh, uh, parliamentarian uh, group that was uh, able to put our our parliament, the, as, the assembly, with the uh, with uh, parliament, the Russian parliamentarians debating the, the important problems that we are facing with. The same with the Ukrainian. We made and later on after the the, the confrontation between Russia and uh, Georgia, we create also the Georgian NATO interparliamentarian group. Always forward, we have done what should be done in order to show up to the alliance what should be done. 
when Russia started to escalate uh, violence against Georgia. I was at that time, it was in August uh, 2008, I was at that time president of the assembly. And I had uh, prepared uh, a visit, official visit to Moscow. And uh, our reaction was really very, very tough. Actually, uh, at that time, I, I sent a communique uh, where I was uh, emphasizing the, the, the situation that we, are, we were against, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, attitude that was disproportionate from, from, from Russia. Uh, the first reaction we had was to cancel. Our, our presidential, uh, presidential trip to, 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 to Russia. That was received by uh, the head of the uh, Duma delegation, Mrs. Sis Sliska, in a very angry way, but that was uh, our decision. And we took also the decision to cancel the visit of uh, two committees of the assembly that were prepared to go to to, to, to visit, to visit uh, uh, Russia. But we were also, I had a decide to go in a presidential visit with a delegation of the assembly with all members of the bureau to Georgia. Our idea was to, 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 to get to visit the capital of South Ossetia. But in this uh, place, Kalgori, we were on the middle of nowhere blocked by the, by, the, by the Russian troops in a very uh, aggressive way with their, their, their uh, weaponry, their assault rifles, and uh, uh, in a, well, we could, have, we could face some fear, but in my way, I had a very strong weaponry. I, has, I have with me around, I think were seven, teams of television. And nowadays, you know, television, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a great arm against uh, oppression, against the attitude of Russia. We decided uh, to uh, change the, the status of, uh, uh, of, of the Russian delegation. On the same time, we decided to reduce the participation of Russia in our uh, meetings. Perhaps the transatlantic link uh, historically uh, was one of the most important uh, events of the uh, 20th century. And in the 21st century, it seems to me uh, it's no less important. In fact, it may be more so. And let me explain why I say that. The transatlantic link brings together uh, two peoples, North America and Europe, both Eastern and Western Europe now, uh, together in a way that is really unprecedented uh, historically, number one. Number two, uh, the, the link uh, and NATO's uh, participation in that link uh, gives rise to the theory or to the supposition that only NATO, if you think about it, if one thinks about it, only NATO uh, has both the political and international blanket of uh, respectability, but it also is the only truly international organization that has the ability and the wherewithal to back up uh, what needs to be done and to do what needs to be done militarily now throughout the world. The threat to the transatlantic alliance is a threat to humanity in one sense of the word. And so NATO and that link become inseparable in terms of our collective security against non-state actors from other parts of the world as well as uh, the recent uh, Russian belligerency in Ukraine. Uh, so 
when one puts this uh, century together and what lies ahead of all of us, the collective security of the transatlantic alliance as represented by NATO is truly a security feature uh, for the entire planet. Today with the advent of the internet and with uh, so-called globalization, there are many young people uh, in North America and perhaps Europe uh, that don't fully appreciate uh, either one, the historical significance of the transatlantic alliance, or two, what it means to them in their future. The transatlantic alliance for the future and for the, the children uh, of North America and Europe is no less important than it was to their forebears in that it represents this security feature that these young people will have to uh, negotiate uh, and there's no other way to bridge the gap between security of our both both our sides of the Atlantic, Atlantic, North America and Europe, uh, better than this security issue. Economically, we both are dependent on one another, transatlantic alliances, trade agreements. We also have, as one might uh, theorize, a uniqueness in this world in that uh, no two groups of people in two different areas of the world separated by an ocean have more in common from a standpoint of values and from a standpoint of, of um, aspirations for the future than North America and Europe. That's unique and I hope the young people will be taught the uniqueness of this uh, phenomenon uh, that has served both sides of the Atlantic so well in my generation and hopefully will continue to do so in theirs as they grasp the impact of what it means to their future. We started our relationship uh, with Russia, especially in 1998, with a joint parliamentary group, or as we told this uh, monitoring group, to monitor the NATO Russia Founding Act. And um, then I think a very decisive date was 2002, when we created the NATO Russia Parliamentary Committee. And that uh, is a very great forum for the Russians to participate in the work of our NATO Parliamentary Assembly. They have all opportunities to uh, participate in our sessions and uh, in the Rose Ross seminar. They can present their perceptions, and I think we have a good forum for dialogue with the Russian delegation. But there were other times, especially, I remember very well, uh, after the crisis uh, regarding to Georgia. After that, and uh, we don't forget uh, the Russian action against Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia, we made restrictions to demonstrate Russia that it is not possible to violate international law and rights. And therefore we made uh, restrictions to demonstrate that um, the Russian delegation too has to keep international rules. We normally think that NATO Parliamentary Assembly is a great forum of dialogue, but I think all members, all member states, all delegations have to keep international law and rules. So the biggest crisis in our relationship to Russia was the uh, attack against uh, Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. That was a, a breach of international law. That was uh, a disregarding of uh, all agreements which were signed by Russia too. And that is the first time after the Second World War that um, they changed borders by the use of military force. And that is a game changer. And we have to react, and we do. So we say, Russia, 
stop this policy. We cannot accept this. And uh, I think, uh, especially in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, we stand side by side to our Ukrainian colleagues. We support them politically, economically. We say that um, we give them a good pers perspective for the future uh, by helping and assisting them going forward. I, for myself, participated in the Orange Revolution 2004. I was there when hundreds of thousands of people demonstrated for their rights, for peace and freedom. I was there one year ago during Christmas time. And I saw in the eyes of young people who said that is for our future, for a better life, against corruption and for a world in peace and liberty. And I think that is what motivates us all, my colleagues, us all in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, to stand at the side of people who want to be free, who want to decide about their own way in the, to the future and to the structures of future. And I think no other country has a right to intervene and to tell them where they have to go. That must be the decision of a country for itself and of the people. And so NATO Parliamentary Assembly demonstrates that we stand at the side of people who will define their way to the future. The added value of partnership policy of NATO is that we sit together in the, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, that we have the great opportunity to explain the values uh, of our great family of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, that we can communicate the forms of cooperation, the various different forms of individual cooperation with other countries. We can explain that in this world, with new challenges like cyber attacks, like hybrid warfare, no country, no nation alone is able to solve these problems. Japan is a great country, is a friended country, is a partner of uh, NATO and the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And my experience was, and it was great, that the policy leaders, the representatives of parliament and of the government said, we cannot accept the breach of law in one hemisphere, as if we do this, we cannot expect that it will be accepted in another hemisphere. So they see the whole world and they will not accept the breach of law by Russia in Europe as they had to think of what will happen in Asia. And that is great. We live in a, in a unit world. And uh, so I think um, that NATO partnerships looking for partners based on the same values, democratic values, like NATO Parliamentary Assembly, will bring an added value for NATO Parliamentary Assembly, for NATO and for our partners uh, in the whole world. When the Berlin Wall fell, Francis Fukuyama said it was the end of history. Uh, but of course it wasn't. Uh, we face new and different threats in the 21st century from uh, Russia, which has adopted a much more aggressive stance from uh, Islamist uh, extremists. And we also face not a threat, but a, a challenge from citizens of our own countries who are, have become war weary. They're uh, asking more questions about uh, defense and security policy and they want to know that uh, what's done in their name by the governments of our countries, allied countries, uh, is uh, uh, both effective and necessary and, and cost effective. One of the things we as an assembly have done is to uh, press for NATO to publish its accounts and to justify more to the public of our countries what they're doing, why it's done and what the benefits are in terms of preserving the rights and freedoms which we uh, uh, subscribe to. Uh, what, is, what is being done and, and, and how effectively it's being done. After the banking crisis, there's been huge pressure on uh, public spending in all allied uh, countries. Uh, and because we have a more questioning public, we have to make the case to the public about why defence uh, spending is necessary. We face uh, new challenges from, uh, from Russia, of course, uh, in Ukraine and Georgia, from uh, Islamist uh, extremists. And uh, 
we need to quantify to the public what these risks are and how defence spending can help to protect the uh, human rights and rule of law, the things that really matter to us. Uh, that's a challenge uh, and it's a challenge which our parliamentary assembly and our national parliaments have got a, a big role uh, to play, uh, acting as a uh, communication belt between uh, citizens of our countries and the governments of our countries. The transatlantic link, the partnership we have between Canada and the United States and European countries is absolutely central to security on both sides of the Atlantic. We in Europe don't spend enough on defence ourselves. Uh, we need the Americans to do some of the heavy lifting on our behalf. Maybe it shouldn't be like that, but it is like that. Uh, and the Americans uh, may not think we're the perfect allies when it comes to defence spending. They keep telling us we have responsibility to do more than we're currently doing. Uh, but we're the best allies they've got. Uh, when it came to uh, American-led operations in Afghanistan or there wasn't a NATO operation in Iraq, 90% of the non-American troops who were deployed and 90% of the casualties that were taken, non-American casualties, came from other alliance countries. So if America wants, for foreign policy reasons, to uh, engage with allies rather than on its own, then it's its allies in NATO that it turns to time and time again, and it's us, the allies, who respond to that call and make commitments and are willing to put uh, soldiers, young men and women, from our countries in harm's way in order to defend the freedoms which are absolutely essential to our countries on both sides of the Atlantic. This alliance, which has um, served us well through the Cold War, is still needed because America doesn't want to act unilaterally. It needs partners for its, its foreign and security policy. Uh, and we in Europe, uh, frankly, because we don't spend enough on defence ourselves, uh, need uh, the muscle, the might, the defence spending which the United States brings. Now, we need to change that to become, uh, to, to share the burden better. But uh, we will still need the United States because we and they and Canada and North America to share the same values of democracy and the rule of law and freedom. Uh, and those values you need to protect with diplomacy and with economic policy, but you also, as a last um, resort, need to have military might to back up those freedoms which we enjoy and which we value so much. Today it is a much different organisation. It's, it still has as a raison d'etre the security and stability of its member countries. That and first and foremost is its task. But at the same time, alongside that, it interprets that security and stability in a much wider way by forming partnerships with a, with a wide range of different countries. And the addition that this assembly makes is to help make that process more transparent, more understandable to the populations of the member countries and to the people, the taxpayers, who have to provide the finance for, the, for these activities. So the Assembly's role is, is to, to hopefully make more transparent, more understandable, and therefore hopefully support the policies of the Alliance uh, as it evolves in the way that it is at the moment. My own view is that the future of the NATO Assembly is in fact a continuation of the sort of work that it's been doing over the last two decades. That is fostering cooperation within the parliaments of member countries, improving awareness, improving understanding, uh, which is uh, an, a continual battle to continue to demonstrate through parliaments uh, and to the populations of member countries um, why NATO exists and the task it's carrying out. And to do that in addition and parallel with the function of creating more and wider relationships in the same way that NATO itself is doing. Uh, partnerships with other countries partnerships which benefit those countries but also benefit NATO member countries themselves and in doing so 
uh, broaden the areas of stability um, which, which exist and which in the end will help the security of all the member countries. So its task very much is to continue to doing what it's doing now, um, to continue to, uh, to, to, to help public understanding of the roles of the alliance, but also uh, to foster a wider form of cooperation among parliaments from very, very different countries. The task of the leadership of the assembly and the, the presidents who have served under the assembly uh, was always to represent to the best of their ability the collective views of the assembly membership. Um, and the collective views obviously cover a wide range of political parties and political views. But these individuals, their task was very much to provide the and to lead the internal consensus amongst the very different members of parliament of assembly countries and to lead those countries and to represent the assembly at international functions and to help promote uh, parliamentary diplomacy uh, through cooperation with partner countries. And that was the task of these individuals at various stages of the history of the assembly from the, de the, the dying days of the Cold War uh, to that very formative phase of expansion to Central and Eastern Europe and to today's world where we face challenges of an entirely different order. The task of the president is essentially to represent the collective views of the assembly uh, and to ensure that the, the, the policies uh, that NATO itself is carrying are understood and hopefully supported.